Thank you very much for reading those passages for us. And it is a very happy day. Again, uh, happy Mother's Day to the mothers. I think you'll get more than five minutes without the children while they're in Sunday school. You might get one hour. Uh, but uh, it's, I guess as we've uh, celebrated our anniversary today, it was lovely to see all those uh, photos going back to how it all began. Really, as we're looking at God's Word uh, today in the book of Acts, we're seeing how the big story of the church began as well, how from small things it has uh, grown into this global worldwide church. So let's, let's come to God's Word in thankfulness, not only that we can be here today, but for how it ha the gospel has spread through the centuries that we can be here. Let's, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for how you have been at work through the centuries, drawing people to yourself. Lord, we thank you for bringing each one of us here today. We know it is your sovereign work in our lives. And we know, Lord, that it, you have been drawing people to yourself from the very beginning. And so, Lord, as we turn to your word now, as we consider how it all began, we pray that you would be spurring us on in our mission, that we would not only look back to the past, but that we would look forward to the future as we seek to make you known to the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, are you for church growth? Are you for church growth? I think during COVID, uh, many people developed a fear of strangers. Uh, suddenly, there would be signs uh, like this one. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, that you would find uh, around about. You try to go to the hospital, no visitors allowed. We started to be suspicious of one another. One of my children was born during COVID. He didn't really see anyone much for a few years. And when he went out and he would see a cat or he'd see another person, he would be scared. Visitors were scary people. But sadly, sometimes it can be like that in churches too. I remember visiting a church once. It wasn't this church. I was seated at the back row because I wasn't a member. Uh, after the service, I was escorted to morning tea to the welcome table where no one talked to me for the rest of the time. Over the years, I've run uh, training for small group leaders. Uh, and in one of the sessions on outreach, I would always ask a question. Should we invite new people to our small groups and more than half the time the answer comes back from these are the leaders of the church they say no visitors allowed at first i would be shocked until i kept hearing this over and over again i would ask why they would say it will disrupt our group we've built these great relationships with each other we'll get sidetracked by their questions we'll be slowed down in our bible studies it's ugly, isn't it? It's, it's rather inward-looking, self-focused, not for church growth, actually against church growth. No visitors are allowed, they say, because we want to be comfortable. We want to maintain our status quo. Now, let me assure you this morning, we have some people here for the first time. You are very welcome. There was no sign on the door saying you're not welcome here. We want you to be assured that we want every person, we want you to join our church and to join our small groups, whether that's Christianity Explore or any of our other groups. That's why we have newcomers lunch. You are welcome. It doesn't matter if you've been here one week or one year. Uh, we want you to ask all of your questions that you have. Please know that you are welcome because God wants his church to grow. He wants to welcome all kinds of people from the nations. It's the whole purpose churches exist and small groups exist, that together we know Christ and that we make him known. Now, last Sunday we had our AGM, and you will know that our church adopted this new mission statement to complement our vision statement. This is it, to preach the gospel of grace, making and building disciples in Penang and among the nations to the glory of God. And what I like about it is that it, it widens our concern to the end of the earth. We are to go to all people without distinction, without 
prejudice. But of course, if we're going to fulfill this mission as a church, if we're going to make any progress at all, then we need to step out of our comfort zone. We need to reach out to people who we may not be comfortable with. We might need to reach out to Chinese speakers or Burmese workers or Thai restaurant owners or Filipino professionals or whoever it is, we will need to step out. And it may have a drastic impact on what our church looks like. You can imagine the photos in two or three years' time. It might look a bit different to how it is now. See, when you, you, when you start a church with 16 adults and three children in someone's home, then everyone knows everyone. Everyone's in the know about every decision. Everyone's opinion is heard. Everyone's opinion is accounted for. But of course, if you're going to grow to 50, 100, 200 or more, then things are going to change. Uh, in fact, you probably won't know everyone. You won't be able to offer your opinion on every decision. And, and it may start to feel uncomfortable. It may start to feel different to how it was before. You may not be so for church growth anymore. Well, in Acts chapter 11, we're shown two contrasting attitudes to church growth. We're forced to consider where we stand. Are you truly for church growth or are you actually against it? What we've seen over these past few weeks, God is fulfilling his eternal plan. Jesus has come as the Christ. He's died and risen in fulfillment of the scriptures. And this and Lord Jesus is sending out his witnesses to the world to gather uh, disciples from the nation. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we've seen in chapters 1 to 6, the gospel go out to Jerusalem. We've seen in chapters 7 to 9, the gospel go out in Judea and Samaria. And we've seen last week in Acts chapter 10, the gospel goes to the world, to the Gentiles. Uh, Peter was sent to Cornelius, a, a, a monumental event so great that it was repeated over and over again. Three times the whole story was told. New details added in each version. And today we see Luke is still not finished with that story yet. He's going to tell it to us a fourth time. Because Acts chapter 10 has made it clear that God has accepted the Gentiles. Acts chapter 10 has shown us that Peter has accepted the Gentiles. But now the question is, will the church accept the Gentiles? Will the church be for church growth beyond the bounds of Israel or not? Will the Gentiles be welcomed or no visitors allowed? Well, let's dive in. Chapter, uh, point one, opposition to the Gentile mission silenced. Opposition to the Gentile mission Silence. The issue is raised in verses 1 to 3 with criticism of Peter's mission. Look at verse 1. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. So some in the church are not very happy about what Peter has done preaching to the Gentiles. They're called the circumcision party. It is a rather odd description, isn't it? I mean, they weren't some uh, crazy party animals. Uh, they weren't uh, some kind of weird political party within the church. Uh, they were just a group of Christians, Jewish Christians, who insisted that all Christians must follow the Old Testament law and get circumcised. You needed to keep the Sabbath. You needed to observe food laws. You needed to practice ritual cleanliness. Uh, all the rules that Peter broke in going to the Gentiles. And so they call Peter in for review. The board of review is, is called in to adjudicate on his actions. It's not surprising because according to the Old Testament, God's law did define what made someone clean and unclean? The temple itself had a big sign indicating that Gentiles were excluded. I'll show it later on. Why should the coming of Jesus make any difference at all to all of that? Except that, of course, it did. The death and resurrection of Jesus meant the old covenant with all those laws was abolished. The new covenant of forgiveness was ushered in so that now belonging to God's people was not a matter of your ethnicity. 
as your faith in Jesus. And so Peter gives his response in verse 4. Peter began and explained it to them in order. Now that phrase, in order, it ought to remind us of how Luke's gospel begins. In Luke chapter 1 verse 3, Luke tells us that he aims to give an orderly account. Because with so many rumors and stories about Jesus flying around here and there in the early church, Luke wanted to set the facts straight. And so he tells us he went back to the sources, he, he checked the facts, and then he wrote an orderly account so that we could have certainty regarding the things that we have been taught. But this happens so often in churches, isn't it? Gossip spreads, rumors circulate, people assume the wrong motives of each other, they fill in the gaps and then draw their own conclusions, whether or not it's the truth. What results is suspicion, slander, division. Apparently, that kind of behavior is as old as the church itself. I once knew of an occasion where a church announced the delivery of a child two weeks before the child was actually born. No one bothered to check with the parents that the child was born or not. Friends, we mustn't be led astray by rumors. We must always go back to the source. We must set the facts straight. We must assume the best motives. Perhaps there's another explanation to the one that you just filled in all the gaps. That's what Peter's doing here. In face of all the criticism that he has, he sets the story straight. Look at verse 5. Uh, he tells the story again. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, uh, all unclean animals. I observed I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and all was drawn up again into heaven. So Peter retells the vision again, where the Lord Jesus announced that the old covenant with its food laws is gone. God has made all things clean, and so we can go and have a lovely lunch at the Chinese restaurant later. And no one needs to be excluded from it, not even the Gentiles. He con continues in verse 11, Behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. The Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house, and he told us how he'd seen the angel stand in his house and say, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. Now, Paul, uh, uh, Paul Peter explains how he ended up in Joppa. It, it wasn't a decision that uh, Peter made alone. It was initiated by an angel who sent various people to Peter. God's Spirit told Peter to go with them, and six men accompanied Peter as he went. And then Peter turns to the conversion itself. He fills in a few more details that we didn't get in the previous accounts. For the first time, we're told what the angel actually said to Cornelius. Look at verse 14. He, Peter, will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. Now, that makes sense of why when Peter turned up, Cornelius had gathered all his household and friends to listen to the message. It wasn't just because he was a model evangelist. God had commanded him to do this. He'd been told that this salvation was not just going to be for him alone because he was a devout and pious person. No, the gospel was going to all of the Gentiles. And verse 14 provides us such a simple and helpful summary. How can a person be saved? How can a person receive eternal life? Well, someone needs to go to them. They need to share the gospel message to them, call them to respond. And when they do, they're saved. They're under God's judgment. They receive eternal life. If you're here today or listening online, you're not yet a believer, hear God's word to you this morning. You need to be rescued. Just like all of us need to be rescued. We're not worthy to go to heaven. 
We can't earn our way to heaven by our own moral or religious acts. We're sinners. We've, we've failed to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. We've failed to submit to God's rule perfectly over our life. We deserve God's judgment. God is a holy God. His holiness, His, good, His justice, His goodness demand that our sins be punished. Which means that apart from Jesus, you or I are headed to eternal punishment. Away from God's presence and blessing in the place called hell. We can't save ourselves. We need to be rescued. And of course, that's why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. He lived the perfect life we have not. He died the death we deserve. And on the third day, he rose again, ascended as king to the throne of heaven to rule God's kingdom until he comes as judge of all. And so he offers us salvation. He offers to rescue us from our sins. We can be saved as you can be saved, as you hear this message and you respond. Will you listen? Now, notice this salvation is offered to Cornelius and his whole household. We don't know if he had any children or not. We can't use this as a proof text for infant baptism, perhaps. But notice the passage doesn't distinguish either. Salvation is offered to the whole household as they respond to the gospel. Well, then Peter comes to the key events in verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And Peter recognizes that this is a repeat of the Pentecost experience. Peter explains that what happened to Cornelius and his household as the Holy Spirit came upon them, it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit that had been promised by John the Baptist. He, Peter continues in verse 16, I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And Peter recognized the significance of all this. If the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit just like the Jews did, well, then the temple could no longer be for Jews alone. Remember, the temple was the place in the Old Testament where God dwelt with his people. Only priests were allowed into the inner sanctuary. The Jews could pray in the courtyard, but the Gentiles were never allowed to enter. They could pray only in the outermost court. Uh, there was this sign on the wall. Two of these uh, stones have been discovered. Uh, they reside in Istanbul Archaeology Museums. Anyone read that? This is the translation. No stranger is to enter the balustrade round the temple and enclosure. Whoever is caught will be himself responsible for his ensuing death. Uh, in other words, no visitors welcome here. I suggest, suggest we don't put one of those stones on the welcome table outside. But if the Holy Spirit was given to the Gentiles, then they themselves were God's holy temple, indwelt by his Spirit. They weren't second-class members as they seem to be here in the Old Testament. Remember what we saw in Ephesians chapter 2. Paul wrote this, through him we both, Jews and Gentiles, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined and together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. This is what happened as the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles. They were God's holy temple, just like the Jews were. They were on equal standing as the temple of God. And so Peter concludes in verse 17, if then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? The visions, the pouring out of the Spirit, all of this was unquestionable evidence that God had included the Gentiles. 
Just as God had promised in Ezekiel 36, which we saw, God poured out his spirit not only to forgive his people, but that, so that he would be made known among all the nations. And, and that's why Peter baptized them. That's why he welcomed them into the church. Who was he to go against what God was doing? He said something very similar to the Jewish leaders in chapter 4, verse 20, though the council that had put Jesus to death. But now he's not talking to these hostile Jewish leaders anymore. He's talking to the church. Would you go against the will of God? Would you stand in God's way as he grows his global church? Well, what about us this morning? Would we stand in God's way, barring the nations from coming into his church, putting up a, a no visitors sign because it's too inconvenient, no outreach to people who will disturb the status quo of our church? We say, let's, let's just be upper middle class, comfortable. Will we side with God as he does his work? I know which side I would rather be on. Well, Peter's critics, they don't want to oppose God. Verse 18, they respond. When they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Their objections are silenced, but not their mouths. The praise of God's grace resounds. The inclusion of the Gentiles is recognized not as the rogue work of a disobedient apostle, but the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's reflect for a moment on this glorious celebration of God's sovereignty in salvation. He says, then, they say, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Notice how repentance secures his salvation. Repentance is when we make a U-turn, when we leave behind our old life and we turn to Jesus Christ as our King and Saviour. But here we're reminded that that decision to repent is not something that we do of our own free will apart from reference to God. Repentance, we're told here, is granted. It is the gift of God. God's grace. Repentance is impossible unless God changes your heart and gives you the new birth. That's what that promise of the Holy Spirit in Ezekiel 36 was all about. God said there, Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. God has to give you a heart transplant before you will want to love and obey him. Notice also the necessity of repentance for eternal life. Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. I think often we speak of, of salvation as believing in Jesus. Uh, trust in Jesus' death, you will be forgiven. That language is used later in the passage. But the Bible also insists that true saving faith involves not only turning to Jesus as Savior, but turning from your old life to Jesus as your King. It is repentance that leads to life. And because of all this is God's work, they, they joyfully celebrate God's sovereign grace poured out on the church. Opposition to the Gentile mission silenced. Well, with that opposition silenced, this now paves the way for active support. Support for the Gentile mission secured. Support for the Gentile mission secured. Now, notice how this section about the Antioch church, it lies wedged between these two episodes about Peter. Chapters 9 and 10, we have the Lord sending Peter to the Gentiles. In chapter 12, we have the Lord powerfully rescuing Peter from the Gentiles. And right here in the middle, Peter's not mentioned, did you notice? It's all about the establishment and growth of the church in Antioch. So for a moment, we leave behind Peter to see how the gospel advances among the Gentiles without the support of the apostles, the direct support 
So verse 19 takes us back to chapter 8, verse 1, where believers were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria by persecution. Verse 19, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Now, I think you can see those, those places there uh, on, on the map, hopefully. You see Antioch. Up there in the north, you can see where Phoenicia is and uh, Cyprus uh, as well. Now, according to the commentator, I. Howard Marshall, he says, Antioch, the capital city of the Roman province of Syria, had grown rapidly to become the third largest city in the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria in Egypt. It had a population of around 500,000, which is big in those days. It was founded by by Seleucid the first, and named in honor of his father Antiochus, there was a large Jewish population. So this Antioch, it's a major city in the Roman Empire. It's a key city for the advance of the gospel to the world. And as you can see on those maps, uh, if you go back to the previous slide, it's not far from Tarsus either, where Saul was left. For the first time we discover that those who were scattered by the persecution, they weren't going and talking to non-Jews, to Gentiles. They were only talking to people like them. I think we can be tempted to do that as well, isn't it? We just only talk to people who are, who are like us. We feel more comfortable like that. But that was about to change. Look at verse 20. But there were some of the men of Cyprus and Cyrene who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. A, a Hellenist was someone who practiced Greek culture and language as opposed to Hebrew language and culture. In the previous chapters, the Hellenists, they seem to refer to Greek-speaking Jews, but it's pretty clear here that these Hellenists are not Jews, are they? They are Gentiles, but this is fertile ground. Look at verse 21. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. See Luke pressing his point. God does not show favoritism. God blesses the ministry to the Gentiles. He brings them to faith and repentance. This church in Antioch, it's established without any of the apostles going there. How does it happen? Simply by preaching the word of the Lord. And Christ works by his spirit. Now, it's still the same way that God grows his church today, isn't it? As we all take the gospel to our family and friends and, and, and colleagues, it's important to have church leaders to preach like this. But how does the gospel spread? It says you go and wherever God has placed you and he gives you the courage to speak, maybe to invite for Christianity Explored next week. It's as we do that, that God in his sovereign grace opens people's hearts to receive the message. So please, friends, don't pick and choose who you will share the gospel with. Pray and speak. Let God pick and choose. Well, if the church starts with preaching, it grows with teaching, and as the apostles now lend their active support, Verse 22, the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Now, there's no suggestion that they're somehow suspicious of the new church here, that they're opposed to the Gentile mission. But we already saw in the previous episode that at least some of this circumcision party are not very happy about what has happened. And even if they're not dominant in the church, they could still cause a lot of trouble in Antioch. And so the church leaders, they send Barnabas one of the key leaders in the church, to put to rest any opposition like this and allow the work to flourish. Remember Barnabas, the one who sold his field to give money to the poor. Barnabas, one of the leaders entrusted to look after the distribution to the widows. In that role, he'd already acted as a link between the Hebrew widows and the Hellenist widows. Barnabas, of course, was the one who vouched for Paul when no one else would trust that he had been changed. He, he took the risk. He brought in Saul before the apostles. He was one of the most godly, faithful leaders of the church. His character was perfectly 
suited to this important moment. And so the church sends him to Antioch so that the new church will flourish. And verse 23, when he came, he saw the grace of God and he was glad. He had the spiritual insight to see that this was God's work. Jews and Gentiles united in Christ. And not only does he accept it, he rejoices in it. He is so thankful to see how God is gathering the nations in. It was a great joy here last night to see about 40 people gathered for our first Mandarin seminar. Alex and I could only understand a small fraction of what was going on, but it didn't diminish the joy of what we perceived. That is how it should be, isn't it? As we rejoice to see the gospel go to the world. And so far from laying any burdens on them to dissuade them from continuing as Christians, Barnabas lives up to his name, the son of encouragement. He encourages them. Verse 23, he exhorted them to them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Barnabas knows the Christian life is hard. And the early church has already gone through so much suffering even in its infancy most of them are there in Antioch because they were running away from persecution but rather than conveniently hiding the fact to make uh, Christianity seem a little bit more appealing he tells them the truth he exhorts them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose he tells them Christian life is going to be hard you need to persevere. You need to be loyal to Jesus, even though it's tough. You need to resolve not to give up when the difficult times come ahead. Some of you may be in those difficult moments right now. Times of great suffering or grief. Times of temptation. Times of disappointment. But when that moment comes, when you lose a loved one, when your health is failing, when your money is running low, well, you need to be ready for it and resolve to keep going. Luke adds in verse 24, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. It's a very similar description to Stephen who got stoned to death. That's why he's preaching boldly. That's why he's not shying away from telling the truth to these new Gentile believers. Because he preaches boldly, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's a good man. He doesn't hide the truth. And look at the results. So they all think, oh, it's suffering. I don't want to become a Christian. No. Verse 24. A great many people were added to the Lord. The Lord blesses the ministry, the church grows. And as it grows, Barnabas knows that he can't do it alone. He needs help. He knows gospel ministry works best when we work together in teams, when we recognize we can do more together than we can do apart. Barnabas wasn't worried that, you know, someone else is going to come into Antioch and overtake his, you know, step on his ministry ground. All he cares about is the growth of the gospel, and Barnabas knows just the right person to bring to Antioch, Saul himself. Remember Saul, who had been commissioned to continue the mission of the servant to carry Jesus' name before the Gentiles and the people of Israel, chapter 9, verse 15. Saul, who already had a history of, of bringing the gospel to Hellenus, chapter 9, verse 28, we read, he went in and out among the apostles at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. He had experience in all this. And Saul himself had been through the hostility and rejection. That's why he was hiding out in nearby Tarsus. And so verse 25, Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And we found him. He brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. Now, he didn't just take a grab and, you know, go for half an hour and then, and then come back. It doesn't work like that. They don't have mobile phones or GPS tracking. You can't send your location so he can find him. He needs to go searching. But he wants Saul there. And Saul 
and Barnabas together are a great team. They give themselves to teaching the word of God. And because that's how God grows his church. That's how he builds up disciples to maturity. It's not just, oh, yeah, let's plant the church and then, you know, chabut, we're off. We're not coming back. No. He, build, he teaches them. He builds them up to maturity. The church grows. And Luke adds in verse 26, in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Uh, it's not just a little bit, a note to file away for your Christian trivia quiz next time. Instead of calling them Jewish believers and Gentile believers, now there is one designation to cover them both. They are Christians. They are followers of Christ, the King. What a momentous moment. For the first time, a mixed Jewish-Gentile church meeting together on an equal footing under King Jesus. Again, this is what Paul describes in Ephesians 2. He, Jesus himself, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. It's very important that we get our identity right as Christians. It's very important that we identify ourselves as Christian first and then whatever other label we have. We are not Chinese Christians or Indian Christians or Reformed Christians or Methodist Christians. You are Christian first and then you are whatever else you are. Because if you are Christian first, you will unite across other markers. You will come together in unity. Here was a church where Jews and Gentiles could be together with no food laws to divide them, no circumcision to separate them, no Sabbaths to set them apart or any other markers. They were together. They were one. They were Christians. And that brings us to the final point this morning, unity of the Gentile mission expressed. Unity of the Gentile mission expressed. So far, everything in this passage has been moving from Jerusalem to Antioch. The Christians were scattered from Jerusalem to Antioch and preached. The church sent Barnabas and then Saul. But in verse 27 to 30, now the tide starts to flow back the other way as it sends financial support to Jerusalem. Verse 27, in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So he said, not a false prophet that came true. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas. And so notice one of the consistent fruits of conversion in the book of Acts is generous giving to meet the physical needs of other Christians. If God has been so generous to us, how he has saved us, how can we close our hand and our heart to our brothers and sisters, our own spiritual family who are in need? No, they won't do that. They give. Verse 29 says, each gave according to their ability. Uh, see, Christian giving is not meant to transfer, transfer poverty from one group to another group. It's all about unity, fairness, and loving care. Look what Paul later writes in 2 Corinthians. He says, if the readiness is there, it's acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness... Your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply their, your need, that there may be fairness. As it's written, the Old Testament, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. Whoever gathered little had no lack. That's what the Christian 
family is meant to be, as we look out for one another, as in response to God's grace, we show loving concern for each other. But notice with this generous gift from the Gentile church in Antioch to the Jewish church in Jerusalem, now Antioch is established as an equal partner. It's not mother church and the Antioch has to do everything they say. Jews and Gentiles united together in loving fellowship. Well, let's conclude and return to where we began. Are you for church growth? Are you for church growth? We've seen here two contrasting attitudes to church growth. The circumcision party criticizing Peter and his mission and Barnabas and Saul actively supporting it. Our mission is to preach the gospel of grace, making and building up disciples in Penang and among the nations to the glory of God. And if we're to achieve that, we can't have no visitor signs up on the door. Like Barnabas, we will find who we need to have to reach who we're seeking out. If we're trying to reach Chinese speakers, we'll find people who can speak Chinese so that they can share the gospel to them. If we're reaching out to the Burmese or the Thais or whatever race is around about us, we'll find what we need so we can reach out to them. And as we reach out, we won't stop them coming in because they make our church feel different to how it was before. May God in his sovereign grace use us to grow and build his church. Not no visitors allowed, but come in. Let us make and build disciples for the glory of God. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your sovereign grace. Lord, we know that if it was not for your work in our hearts, by your Holy Spirit, not one of us would be here. Not one of us would be saved. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your Spirit, changing our hearts that we might turn to Jesus as our King. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us an open heart to reach out with the gospel to the nations. Help us not to stay within our bubble. Help us not to be afraid of change. Help us to embrace all that you bring into our midst and indeed send us out into the world to reach those different to us. Lord, we know this is your work. So, Lord, give us your strength. And, Lord, as we look forward to future anniversaries in the years ahead, we do pray, Lord, that we will be celebrating many more people that you have brought to the Lord Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.